really build it back, you know, through through many ways, right? Um, through, a, I think the best way to get out of it is to actually create a schedule. Be very disciplined in doing something right. And it doesn't have to be something big. It can be something small. Like, for example, um, setting a aside time like every day in the next six months to just go for a 10-minute run in the morning and achieve that. So do little things that actually help build that confidence level up again. So I actually, when I was at my lowest state, right, Dash, I was, um, I consulted my uncle who was a very close, one of my closest relative. And he said that, um, I think you need to create habits, right? And habits, I didn't understand at 19 going on 20 at a point, what, what is this habit? What's the power of having a habitual cycle and a habitual life? What is it? And it wasn't until I went through the process and I realized how powerful it was because if you, if you set something that you have to do on a daily basis and you have, have to accomplish it, it's not a matter of you can't, you, you, there's a no accomplishment. You have to do it. Now, then across that period of time, no matter how shitty that day goes, at least you know you've accomplished one thing. And that was the slowly, you know, that slowly built up my character, built up my confidence back up again, that life isn't that shitty. No, there is so much to unpack from what you're saying. You started off by also by saying there's no such thing as a blueprint for success, yeah. for starting up. Now, a lot of uh, young, a lot of entrepreneurs, first time nascent entrepreneurs, always believe there is a blueprint. There is a there is a business. I plan. wish there's a blueprint. Yeah. You know, I mean, the 19 year old me wished there was a blueprint. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, they come up with this idea there has to be some kind of a blueprint that success is a straight line, but it's not. I mean, I can, I'm sure Dato is here, who's a founder of the university, and you can say that. Nothing he planned actually happened as it is. And I'm sure that's the same way with you. And always there are surprises. And, um, you know, this shows that I'm getting on with age and I forget my train of thought. So, <laughs> so, so the thing is, and you say that since there's no blueprint, you start small. You build habits, start small. And they say entrepreneurs do the doable and then they push it. And you test start, start mm. testing it out now um i just want to bring this back slowly to your rebelliousness and then you said that you have family traditional businesses yeah so there is an already an entrepreneurial gene uh, in you and there has you have been exposed to entrepreneurs uh and they rebelled at that time that's why they did not take a job and traditionally so I, I i won't call my family entrepreneurs i call them businessmen sure that's... there's a difference right at least to me the difference between entrepreneurs and businessmen is that businessmen look at an opportunity to make money their goal is to make money not wrong right it's your own personal preference but entrepreneurs um their main focus is to solve problems right is to innovate so that's the key difference sure yeah um, i'm familiar with that but at that time, they were also need finders, and they found a need to make money. Uh, so the need finders and problem solvers are doing the same thing almost, right? So talk to us about Droppy. How did you come up with the idea? And if I am, uh, say, a Taufu Fa seller by the mm. uh, roadside, uh, okay, maybe Taufu Fa is a bit... I too, like Taufu Fa. I love Taufu Fa, yes. Yeah. Okay, so how do I use Droppy and how did this business come about? How did you find this need to find this? Yeah, um, in brief, a lot of micro SMEs and SMEs today, they are not, they don't have a proper trail of documentation. When I say documentation, it could be as simple as a purchase order, something that they write down and order from their suppliers. Um, and they don't keep that at all. So the lack of having those documentation doesn't allow them to go to suppliers or banks and negotiate for better pricings or more access to 
financial opportunities like capital, working capital or anything. So when, and, and this was very adamant 60 years ago when my grandfather first started his business and it's still, it's a, still a problem now, right? Which shocked me and I was like, what? It's still a problem now? I mean, what age are we living? So um, we scoured out there. Are there any solutions out there in the market in Malaysia? Nope, there wasn't any. Are there any solutions there in Southeast Asia? Nope, there was not any, right? We only hear digitizations coming from large companies like uh, Microsoft, Oracle, uh, SAP, right? So these guys are large, but are they really addressing the micros? Are they addressing the SMEs? No, they are not, you know? So there was the gap in the market that, you know, both myself and my co-founder decided to sit down and said, dude, this, um, there's this need, there's 1.4 million MSMEs and SMEs in Malaysia, and um, they comprise, and not only in Malaysia, in Southeast Asia, they are like the backbone. So what are we going to do about it? There's a huge market. It made sense. No one's addressing it. Can we build a solution to actually solve it? Do we have the skill sets to do it? Ticked all those boxes, and that's where we started. We started as an MVP first. We launched a very simple, quick platform just to really test out whether these traditional 50, 60 year old uncle aunties would, would even place orders like through their mobile phone, right? You know, you can see them with their, their, their poor eyesight, be like, I don't know where to click and whatnot. But thankfully, and this one thankfully to the age of e-commerce, B2C e-commerce, where Lazada and Shopee and the rest have pumped so much money in educating the market, these 50, 60 year old uncle aunties, understand how to place orders online. So all we needed to do is replicate that experience and just put it to B2B. And that's it, right? And we started getting orders. It would be validated that, these, that this consumer behavior can shift, right? So how can we scale from there? How can we grow from there? Who do we need to actually talk to? And who, how do we build that ecosystem so that our customers and our users stick? So four and a half years later, we are servicing close to uh, 60,000 MSMEs and SMEs up to date. We have been working with um, close to 5,000 traditional wholesalers and distributors just specifically want to service this market. We're not even like 10% there yet. We're still scratching the surface. Um, and think there's so much more potential that, that Droppy can actually do and value add to this uh, industry. So we're very excited, actually, of what's to come. Someone is saying, thank you for this talk. It inspires me. Truly very motivating. Glad he's finding this very useful. <clears throat> yeah, so I just want to go back to the point where you came up with this idea, the need. Mm -hmm. Did you do a major market research? You said you came up with MVP. For those who... I apologize. Uh, I forgot. It's a jargon. It's a startup jargon. That, that so it's, a, it's a startup jargon yeah. called minimum viable product. That means you don't build the whole thing. You build a, a prototype or something like... Yeah, it's uh, like a prototype. A, yeah, something yeah. slightly more than a prototype that a customer would pay for. So yep. you don't raise all the money. So that nucleation phase you'd like to tell us about whether did you do a major business plan market survey and did all those things or the did consultant you... in me wanted to yeah. right yeah. so like i was a i was an aspiring consultant wanting to be the mckinsey's the bcgs and the Baines. this was when i was in uni right and i was i did my uh, part-time in consulting thing but so the consultant sure. in me wanted to yeah. But then my co-founder who is like extremely scrappy he's like completely different from me he's like no len stop you know, it's too much. Uh, it's, let's just talk it out and just address one single thing only, right? Forget about business plans, forget about what, like those formal stuff. Let's just go straight and talk about our customers. What are they? What is their pain problem? Um, and really deep diving into that. So we, we did our own understanding in the market differently rather than what the textbooks has said. What we did was that we um, really went to talk to a few uncle aunties, the hawker stores or Kudarunji owners and whatnot, really understand what are they going through on a day-to-day -day basis. Because the assumption that I had was my grandfather used to do this. You know, this is how he actually struggled, blah, blah, blah. So I took that as a precedent or at least like a supporting case and see do, does the market 
feel the same way as of today? And the answer is yes, right? Um, after talking to, you don't have to talk to a hundred of them, maybe like just, just a few key, key. key ones, yeah. So we talked talk to them, that validated, and that's where we sort of started building um, what, what is the, the main problem that they have, and we started building that solution for it. Great. Yeah. So to those who are listening, this is how real entrepreneurs think and build. They identify a need, immediately speak to people, and not do an exhaustive uh, analysis, but speak to the real people who are having the pain pain points and then start building a simple product that they can sell. There's a question from Sheng Yang Su. How do you obtain the resources to build your startup? Did you co op with other company? That's or find like a two part question, right? Yeah? yeah. That's a two part question. Yeah, there's a two part question there. Yeah. 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 Um, good question, Sheng Yang. Um, three Fs friends, families, fools. Yeah. Right? How do you obtain your resources to build your startup? Right? You want capital? Convince your family and friends, and of course, the poor bugger, the fools who believe in your vision, your dream, when you have nothing to prove. Right? You literally have no revenue, no traction. You just have an idea. So that goes back to the power of storytelling, and that's why I commend Prof. Right? Like you know, I think storytelling is something that, and this is a personal opinion. Right? Storytelling is something that a lot of entrepreneurs in Malaysia and in Southeast Asia really need to work on. Um, we have been recently invested in um, by, by Y Combinator. So Y Combinator is a huge um, US, uh, it's actually the best accelerator um, wow. in the world. And getting into, getting invested by them is even harder than entering Harvard, Harvard yes. right? So when, when I went there, like my co-founder and I went there, what we noticed was that the way and the art of storytelling um, majority of the U.S. startup is radically different from what I see in Southeast Asia, right? And that's how they can convince investors, convince their three Fs, family, friends, and fools, to invest so much in them. They're not talking about 100,000. They're not even talking about thousands, not 100,000, millions, um, without any proof or traction at all. So, yeah. And I and and you guys can really really see lah. Like the best storytellers out there um, are usually the ones that are always in the forefront of the media, right? People get people talk about them a lot because they feel inspired about this. So that's also something that um, many entrepreneurs, as an entrepreneur, if you struggle or if you really want to raise capital and convince people that your vision or your goal or whatever you're building is amazing, that's something you need to double down on. So did you start off with uh, raising money or did you start with uh, your own, well, um, the, our with journey, the three Fs? Yeah, so um, our journey was a little bit different, right? Because before we started Droppy, um, myself and my co-founder, we managed to sold our... So because of the venture building. Correct, one. the venture yeah. building one. So we have a little bit of capital that we, boot, in startup term, we bootstrap. Bootstrap meaning the founders uh, pump in or inject in their own capital just to kickstart of the business. Um, there's no right or wrong. Like I've also met like entrepreneurs who don't really have that luxury, right? And what they did was that they go out there and hunt down capital from investors and, and they've succeeded. Yeah. And today, you guys are so lucky. You have equity crowdfunding platforms. You have a lot more angel investors. You have like many VCs, uh, you know, growing pool of VCs, uh, venture capitalists in, in Malaysia. So you, access to funding right now is the perfect timing, especially when economy is shitty, right? So, yeah, I, 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 if, if there's all of this um, access to capital, right, like what, five years ago, I think like we would have raised more. Right. Yeah. Why Combinator? Interesting. I want to come back to that. I mean, Sophia has a question. If someone who's a fresh graduate and he's about to start his own startup, do you think it's better to start up on his own or collaborate with your friends? All right. This is a good question. Um, amazing, amazing question. Yeah, I'm. There's two. There's a lot of um, sets of opinions about this, but I'm in the opinion of always start off with a co-founder, at least one. Why? Entrepreneurship journey is a very lonely and tough journey to go through. We're not talking about a start. The start is just scratching the surface. We're talking about like how can you build a scalable business? You're in this to put in so much blood, sweat, and tears. You might as well go all out and at least get an ex a good 
massive exit out of it, right? Um, when I say good massive exit, I don't know. What's your number? 50 million, 100 million, a billion? I don't know, right? But, but have that number. And in order for you to hit that, your journey towards that path is very long. Um, statistically, it takes an average startup, this is a global statistic, stats, yeah, 11 years before they exit. And whether it's an IPO um, being bought out by uh, other big companies, why not? It, it takes them 11 years. So when you reflect back on this, can, are you able to build a business um, by yourself uh, in, in 11 years? You can, there are people who does that, but it will be a very lonely journey. Right? You will have a lot of emotional struggles, especially if you're a first-time founder. Please, please, please do find someone to co-partner or co-found this with. 11 years to 100 million. That's the time for two PhDs. <laughs> I think it's okay. It's worth it. So you should try. <laughs> so, um, you know, I just want to ask, how do I determine my startup costs and other expenses? Before that, I would like to ask you, how do you find a co-founder? How do you know this is the right co-founder? I don't know, man. Yeah, so... You don't know. Like, right. um, I was uh, very fortunate to have worked with my co-founder in the past, and that was pretty well. Um, it, it, I knew him since uni. He was a friend, um, but we sort of lost touch, and we got back to, like, you know, we came back and worked together in the same company again when I came back to Malaysia. So I was lucky. I guess mm -hmm. there's no one right way to find a co-founder, right? I think... It's not about how do you find a co-founder. I think you need to question um, yourself. What are you good at? What are your strengths? What is your superpower, mm. right? And if you're building a startup, especially as you scale and grow, you are literally building your Avengers team, right? A team of superheroes who would lead and take charge in this to dominate the market and the industry that you're at. Now, in order for you to build the Avengers team, each superhero have their own unique skills and abilities. So what are your skills and abilities um, as, as an Avenger, right? And then you find what are the missing gap and find that in a co-founder. Don't find someone who you just like, ah, I, I think I can, you know, dash your, you look pretty good. I can see you every day. Okay, lah, you be my co-founder. Right. You know, yes. That's not the case, right? You, you got to find someone who compliments you and who can really take your business to the next level. Beautiful. So we'll take this question. How do I determine my startup costs and other expenses? Um, Google. <laughs> okay, so, so um, uh, I, I think like maybe just like just treat it as a project, right? Don't think of it like a business. Just treat it as a project. If you Before you start off this project, what does it take for you? What are the costs or the expenses that requires you to run this? So if it's a tech startup, then maybe like, your website cost, um, yeah. like, I don't know, starting a tech company is actually very cheap, lah, I would say. Um, but if you're starting like an FMB restaurant or whatnot, then you have a different startup cost, right? You have your your um, outlet, that you, that you, the rental space, uh, procurement, inventory costs, etc. So it's very different. Um, so there's a lot of uh, answers out there in Google. I hope that would help you. Thank you. Yeah, there's lots of uh, resources out there on starting up costs. There's a question by, um, by Ahmad Atik. At the start of the talk, you spoke about your passion for music and, uh, and yep. the arts. Even with all your success, does some part of, your, of you regret not being able to pursue? Never. A beautiful question. Never, because uh, my passion for arts and my relationship with arts and music is uh, very different. I think it's... Um, it's never ending. It's not. It's not independent of each other. I still see that there is form of art when it comes to running a tech startup, yeah. and the art comes in a form of education. Right? How do you storytell? How do you engage with the customers and whatnot? And that requires some form of art and skills. So. Oh, yeah, the recent talk by Seth Godin. Every one of us who are doing good work is doing art. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, and I hope all of you, especially those of you with PhDs, right, you know, graduate, get all of this doctorate degree and value impact to the community and society. 
I want to come back to superpower, but before that, Amy T has asked a question. Do you think being entrepreneurs will be more challenging during the post-COVID? During and post-COVID-19? Yeah. No, it's easier yeah. because there's so much uh, resources out there. Um, resources in a form of, like I've mentioned, financial resources. There's so much more opportunities and access to that. Um, it's and, and there's so many problems to solve. Yeah, there's a lot of problems to solve, yeah. right? So who knows? Maybe in this space, uh, um, within the community that we have here, maybe someone could figure out how to distribute vaccine in a faster way. Yeah. Wow, these APU students are amazing. They are non-stop questions. Hudi Adam, what piece of advice would you give to college graduates who want to become entrepreneurs? All my questions I have to stop now. Stick there. It's good. Yeah. Um, three words. Learn, unlearn, and relearn, right? Um, I, I want to double click on that a bit. Yeah. Double. <laughs> um, learn, unlearn, relearn. Um, throughout my whole life, I think I've been in various different industries, um, experienced failures, successes, and whatnot. And most importantly is, is to be resilient. And I guess the resilient part comes in by being adaptable to, ev to ever-changing sort of period. I'm in a tech industry right now. The way that things are changing and moving are extremely fast. Nice. Um, it's scarily fast, right? The minute that you are stagnated, or, or at least that like you think you're, or the minute when your company is slowing down, competitors catch up. And in fact, they might beat you. So it's a never-ending game about you know, how do you grow faster? How do you become the biggest? How do you capture the biggest market share? I think all of you guys know the classic case of Grab and Uber, right? Yeah. Who, who ended up winning the market? Right. So, so it's about that. Like, how do you keep doing it? And the only way for you to do it is to always, like, pick, pick up new things, like, keep learning. But know that whatever you've learned might not be useful in, as times change. So you got to unpack that. Got to know how to delete that and remove from your, your storage, right? And relearn something new. Yeah. More questions from Tavia Jasleen. Would you suggest someone or society that able to guide a startup? Because I ever join one of the startups, but then end up if it is not progressing. So who's the best guide in what happens if it's not progressing? So someone or society guide us to guide a startup, uh? Tough. tough. Um, I think tough. a good mentor is always important. Yeah, I think I think mentorship is important. Yeah. But before, so I think there's 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 this um, what what do you call it? Um, a, a, a stagnated mindset, right? When people think that oh, I don't have a mentor, and so that does that means that I don't want to start a startup because uh, high there's a higher chances where I will fail. I think the best mentor you should look for is actually. In a cheesy way, yourself. How can you keep that discipline or that 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 process of learning, unlearning, and relearning, um, and and being that sponge? And because not everyone is lucky enough to find a mentor that can help you. Um, not not everyone is that. So you got to really think about how push come to shove. If you're all alone in this. Can you still survive? And if the answer is no, that's okay. It just means that perhaps entrepreneurship is just not the path for you, right? Um, but if the answer is yes, and you're willing to put tooth and nail, double down on it, give it a try. Janice, more questions. What's the most do we important want to thing? Open, do we want to open questions to the room? <laughs> yeah, first, we should you know? open questions like, to the room. Like, <laughs> okay, I let, love the virtual question, guys. It's yeah, great. But, yeah, but let's take this just one very quickly. What's the most important thing before launching your startup? And then we open questions to the room. Yeah, I we... so the most important thing before launching your startup, identifying the customer problem. Yeah. Yeah. Identifying the customer problem. That's very, very important. And I want to come back to superpower later. But anyone here in the room? Mira, any questions? Why you put someone Mira on the spot? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's someone has a question back where, there. Where is the question? Oh, okay. 
Hello. Okay, hi, Lenis. Uh, that was very inspiring from you, for, uh, whatever you said right now. Uh, I had a question. Uh, I've tried to venture in the startup world as well. And uh, what I've seen is that you need some sort of experience at the end of the day in whatever you're doing. Mm. So to get that experience, you have to have a, at least have a job first, right? Uh, not necessarily a job, but uh, anything, a skill set you have to learn or something like that. So what the question is, uh, as an entrepreneur, is it harmful for you to go out there and look for a job with an entrepreneurial background? Um, definitely not. I think entrepreneurial background or entrepreneurship is not, is not a thing. It's an attitude. Being entrepreneurial is a mindset. So if you have that sort of mindset, you can literally go into anywhere, any industry that you want to learn a bit more into. Like, for example, maybe you want to come up with a solution that solves global climate change, right? And in order for you to know that, you got to deep dive into really understanding what actually is the problem with our climate change right now. Um, so the answer is no. Entrepreneurial, just like what Dash said earlier on um, today's session, on being entrepreneurial is problem solving, um, being resilient, problem solving, and do whatever it takes to get that problem solved. Yeah. True. Thank you. Yeah. There's another question here. Um, uh, my question is, <clears throat> I'm sorry. This is my. I'm just a student in APU and uh, uh, Lenis. I have a little question about the entrepreneurship that based on the, what I read, uh, uh, based on what I read in articles, I mean, do, do you agree that entrepreneur has the like, certain trait called obsessive? Do you experience that as well? Or do you disagree with that? You know, being obsessive like artist. Yeah. Um, for those who know me, and I think any one of you in this room, after that, you can actually vouch with Cheryl, right? You can tell, she can vouch for you how obsessive I am at what I do. I obsess with it day and night. I think, eat, live, breathe, sleep about the problem that I'm solving. Um, and the reason being because you are actually, and this is, this is the obsession actually comes from passion, actually. If you're really passionate about wanting to 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 solve a problem then that wouldn't be um, an issue um, yeah so so generally yes um, and it doesn't mean that because you're not obsessing on certain things right that means you're not an entrepreneur it just means that you haven't found the right problem okay I said just, yeah just asking the question yeah yeah Hard question not, not just being judgmental yeah so how do you gravitate towards the problem that you want to solve and how do you build passion? And Ooh. more questions are coming. Wow. It's, it's amazing. We can be here for two hours. But no, we'll end at 6.15, Sean. Yeah, so... Ron, so any questions? Okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go, go, go. You have a question? Oh, okay. Okay. But to answer Dash, your, your, your big question, right? How do you gravitate towards finding a problem that you're passionate in? That's like finding something that the purpose of why you exist is literally like that, you know? And you, there's no, I don't know. I'm, I'm only 29, guys. Such a big, hard question, you know? Um, but I would say you got to ask that question yourself. What bothers you? Hmm. What bothers you at night that you can't sleep or that annoys you so much that, that, that it frustrates you that no one out there or there's no solution or service out there in the market that addresses this problem, right? Um, how I ended up with Droppy is because of, you know, really understanding and reconnecting back to my family roots. That's how I got to appreciate where I am today and that kind of got me to learn a little bit more about my family struggles and reflecting back upon this. So it's a journey, right? So I think everyone has their own journey to find that purpose. And you just got to ask yourself at this. Worst case scenario, you guys, I don't know if you guys have watched this movie, Eat, Pray, Love. You just do that, 
right? Uh, throw everything away, just venture out, immerse yourself in society and, and, and open your eyes into like real world problems, right? And then, yeah, maybe something sticks. Beautiful. You know, this reminds me of what Naval Ravikant, who's the founder of Angel Lists in the US. Uh, mm. He's a good friend, but now he's invested in about 200 companies, including Uber, Twitter, and all said. All of life is in search is in search of who you are and what you what needs you the most. I think that's how you find some of your great problems. Uh, in your opinion, do you think with all the technology we have nowadays, is it better to start an online-based business or just a normal business? If it lets you say you are a fresh graduate and willing to start your own business. I, again, problem to solve. Yeah. Online. So the question is, guys, I don't know if you guys can see the question here, but for the floor, the question was, is it better to start an online-based business or just a normal business? I don't know, man. Like, well, you got to study the market. You know, you got to see that is this, is this something that um, no one's out there solving or no one out, is out there like serving the community at? If the answer is, yeah, no one's solving that, then you do it. And it doesn't have to be online. Online is just an avenue. You can be offline as well. Um, it, yes, agreeably, like I, I do agree that it is a little bit harder to start offline business now, especially if it, in retail when food traffic is really low and whatnot. But that's where it comes to, you know, are you understanding your customer problem uh, or the market problem really, really well first? So, yeah, actually, yeah. before I forget, I must tell the students out there uh, the APU enterprise team with all the uh, people who are here who are members. They are actually changing the syllabus of uh, entrepreneurship in the university, and it's actually going to cover how do you come up with your idea, how do you define your superpower, how do you build, how do expert entrepreneurs think, how do you design MVP, design thinking, how do you do your venture building. It will take you through an amazing journey of what it means to start, how do you identify a customer problem, it's going to be an exciting uh, subject, actually. Uh, the entrepreneurship syllabus is, is going to be pretty awesome, I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. So that's so get more students to join APU and sign up for the entrepreneurship program. Segway promo there. <laughs> promo, yes. Promo, promo, yes. Actually, not just empty promo. It's a lot of good work is going in there. Any other questions? How did you? How did you get? inspired with the idea of Droppy. I think uh, you have answered that yeah. earlier. Is, uh, this, is this broadcast recorded? Yes, if so, yeah, you just go back, wind back a few, like maybe 20, 30 minutes, you, you can hear my answer to that. There's a question there, amazing. There's one question there. Yeah. Someone wants to contact you in the question if they want to invest. <laughs> if you if you can invest in them. Yeah, drop me a LinkedIn. Yeah. I'm always looking for really good innovation. Hi, Len. Uh, actually, I have two questions. Yep. The first question is very simple. Are you single or you have my family? <laughs> 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 no, don't get me wrong. I'm no, I know. I'm this happily is... married. Yep, yep. <laughs> uh, not married. Yeah. So uh, my next question is, do you think that starting... Uh, to, to start up a company, right, mm. or to begin with the entrepreneurship, the best time is when you are young, 19, yes. hot and passionate. Yes. And then, what do you think when you are growing up, you have a family, managing your family, wife, yeah. children, parenting, and so on? Yeah. Um, it's about probability, like what I think um, to your question, right? When you're young, you have the probability or at least like the amount of responsibility that you have is very minimal. It's only about yourself. Your, your goal is to take good care about yourself. Sure, you know, this goes out the window of filial by Asian values, right? I don't know if my parents are watching this, they'll be like, really, you don't take care of me. Um, but, but for sure, when you're young uh, and you're not married, the only goal for you is to really take good care of yourself. So you have more capacity to actually think about how can you do more, 
or, or problem solve. You have more time. But the moment when you start getting married and you have loans, you have like more, more stuff to pay, pay off and whatnot. So these are the other factors that would burden you, right? Burden meaning that you have to take into consideration. It doesn't mean that you won't or you're not able to start your own entrepreneurship journey when you're married. I just think that you really got to be, you, you just have to factor in more variables uh, into it. So typically, um, when I see it, um, statistically, when people are married, they tend to not draw or they're not drawn into entrepreneurship mainly because of that. Yeah. Actually, I've got another view on this, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. Dash. So there is a lot of research that's coming out to say that uh, that's also the typical entrepreneurial profile as be the 20-year-olds. But the successful, more middle-aged people married like yourself you know, and, and actually launch successful companies. Mm -hmm. The percentage of successful companies are also after 40 or 50s because you have seen enough, you have understand intimately the problems that you are wanting to solve and you are able to take what they call as affordable risk. What can you afford to lose? And what can you start? So there, there's a lot of evidence about starting late. So it's not too late as well if you want to leave academia and go and start a venture. I'm not suggesting that, but if that's what you want to do. Is enterprise program like a club or like a subject? Are this, I think questions directed to me. Oh, Dato, yes. I just want to chip in. Sure. When you talk about... Uh... Midlife. Whether you are young or with responsibilities, don't forget uh, Colonel Saunders created yeah. KFC when he was in his 60s. Yeah. Yeah? 60, so it's never too 65. late. 65. 65. Uh, yeah. So it's never too late. Never too late. But remember what you have learned from Lenny's that one, you got to have the passion for it. Yeah? And I, I can resonate with, with you on a lot of what you said. Yeah? You have to be a rebel. Don't forget, you've got to be a rebel. I mean, I'm not saying you've got to go and fight your parents or anything <laughs> like that, but you, you've got to do the out of the ordinary because if you followed the trend, yeah. then you may not be able to get there. All right? You've got to be a rebel. I mean, to be frank with you, I was a rebel in my family too. All right? Seriously, I was. Yeah? And, um, but a lot of things happen when you are moving out of the ordinary. That's, that's what it is. Mm. But... Lenny has said it again and again. You've got to find a problem you're trying to solve. Okay? You've got to find that niche. Yeah. Uh, because you just can't decide. And that question on whether it should be online or motor-based and all that is, is something that comes along as to what the best fit is. You don't start off with that sort of thing. You know what I mean? You, you've got to find uh, a need, a need, uh, a desperate need, um, and then pursue that in the best way possible, whether it's going to be online or otherwise, it's what's the best way possible. I mean, that's how you got to address it, correct? But don't forget, age is no barrier. Um, being married or not married is also no barrier, okay? Uh, it is how you want to position yourself, but it is, you're right in saying that when you're young and you're carefree, uh, you, you, you're, you can afford to take more risk because, uh, you know, you can sleep in a sleeping bag. You don't even need a roof over you, you know, at that time. But you can't take your five kids and push them into a sleeping bag. You know, that's that's the difference. Okay? I just thought I want to chip in, especially the KFC story, because that started very late. Absolutely. Yeah? Okay. Maybe we should have you in, on the seat on Enterprise Wednesday, one of the days, one yeah. of the weeks. Uh, Some days. So like. that we can hear your story as well. Maybe no, that, you, would, you, you that would be inspiring for the midlifers, actually. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know. <laughs> so, um, yes, uh, thank you, Dato, for the question. Is enterprise program like a club or a subject? It's actually an entire initiative uh, APU is putting together to build the entrepreneurial DNA. Uh, it, a lot of people are involved in it, and I have a small part in it. Uh, I would think, you know, once the website is up and all, go look out for it, stay tuned. Uh, the enterprise team is doing great work so that you all 
learn to be entrepreneurial within the university and even learn to get some entrepreneurial experience by launching your own projects uh, from the university. And the university is a safe place, even if you fail, uh, you fail cheap. Uh, and, and, and then you could start, it's, it's like playing chess game, you know, you lose a few times before you become a good chess player. So it's, it's important. So we are at 6.12, Lenny has to leave soon. Um, I'm going to ask you one last question. Uh, uh, there's so many questions coming. What have you changed your mind about in the last decade? That I know everything. Amazing, thank you. Yeah. Prof, any questions and would you like to close the session? Yeah, I, speaking of rebels, uh, I'm sure you meet many rebels as competi competitors uh, in the market. Mm -hmm. So being an e-commerce company, uh, this is a two-pronged question. One is, because you're, you're a tech e-commerce e tech-based company, right? So how do you evolve from a tech perspective? Because that's, that's a big challenge by itself, yeah? Mm. Uh, because you gotta, you got to stay competitive. So how do you use technology to stay competitive? Yep. Uh, question one. Uh, question two is, there are others, uh, I would call them uh, rebels, but they are your peers and your competitors uh, all put together in the same market space as you are. How do you uh, keep up with that challenge? So to answer that is basically, how do you educate yourself to keep up with these two challenges? Right. Um, the first one, data. So at the end of the day, being very data-driven um, and collect a lot of data to understand your customers and your users, that's the only way for you to know what to build next. How is your product evolving? How is your service evolving? Really, really understand to the core. Um, I know many of you here also have seen a lot of changes in the last 12 months, right? That COVID has changed a lot of consumer behavior in the past. Uh, many people would just walk into store and purchase items. Now, people are preferring to do online. So how do you capture that and identify those trends before it happens? So you can only do so with data and forecastings. So that's number one. And number two, in regards to competitors. Um, sorry, how would I keep up myself or whatnot? How do you beat um, them as they keep on? How uh, do I beat them? Yeah. Be number one. How do you stay number one? <laughs> How do you stay number one? Um, build an ecosystem. So I don't believe that um, that that. In, so this is a oh, this is my my perspective and my opinion, right? If you're asking me this question ten years ago, how do you beat the market, right? Or how do you be number one? Raise so much capital that you dominate the market. But now. It's completely different. It's all about building ecosystems. And why is there a difference? Because people are smarter. Consumer has changed, uh, people meaning investors are smarter. Consumer behavior are different. Um, the landscape is evolving. So take for example, in the days where B2C e-commerce first started. How many of you here first used Lazada when they first launched? No? I used it the moment, the first month that they launched. You know how long did it take for them to deliver my item? One and a half freaking months, all right? Uh, and, and all I did was order a USB cable, okay? One and a half months. But that's because they have issues everywhere, okay? And how did Lazada dominate the market? I raised enough capital to educate the market, throw promotions, and double down on that again and again and again. And that's exactly what Shopee is doing. And that's what exactly other B2C e-commerce companies are doing. But does that work now? If you start a B2C e-commerce company today, do you think raising more capital and burning all of that would get you number one? Maybe, but chances are very slim. It doesn't give you that differentiating factor because that factor, that problem is solved already. Right? So what is the next problem? Now, the next problem would be people wanting to feel that they belong somewhere, a community. 
I want to belong somewhere. So that's where the ecosystem comes in. You're not only providing them one solution, you're providing them a something like a, a, a online community where they can find everything that they need because it's so customized to them. Yeah. Great. Thanks. I can't let you go. Oh, we should let you go without asking Peter Thiel's favorite question. Oh, no. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? And that including myself? Sorry? And that including myself? No, Sometimes no. I doubt myself. Okay. No, what other people disagree with? Okay, so the question is, what is the... What's the important truth do very few people agree with you on? What is it that something that you really believe um, that... That you don't have to burn money to dominate the market. That you, don't, that, you, that you have to be not profitable to build a scalable tech company. Thank you, Lenise. Yeah. With that, we'll end the session. I would like to thank Lenise. A big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, guys. For... Thank you all for being here. Thank you guys for being online. Yeah. Great questions. And I would also like to take the opportunity to thank the enterprise team, Dr. Vinesh, Professor Vinesh, Mira, Janita, Haslina, Mr. Chong, and his team of people, and everyone who actually made this whole thing, uh, 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 they just really blew it out of the water. I mean, I walked in and I saw in that big digital board, my face, I said, oh my God, why doesn't this guy comb his hair? And, you know, when I saw it, I said, oh my God. And then it just frightened me, you know, and it's, it's everywhere. And when I walk in here, it's amazing. Thank you very much to the team. And uh, I'll pass the mic to Prof. Do you want to close? Yeah, I am supposed to close. Uh, Len, I've been getting a lot of uh, text messages. Uh, one of it was uh, interesting. You spoke from your heart. I think that's very appreciative from the students uh, because you could connect. And the main thing about uh, anything within enterprise or entrepreneurial is to connect. And you did exactly that. And uh, you. wish you all the best of luck. Thank you again for coming here. Yeah. Uh, definitely a real fire site is raining right now to put out the fire. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I hope That's I why hope. there's the rain. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we have something uh, as a token for you. Oh, thank you. And I want to pass that to you right now. I, I'll pass the token. No, we'll get a commitment. You'll come back again to the university. Yeah, awesome. hell yeah. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. It's fun. It's been fun. Is there so thank you, Len. And thank you, Dash, for being dashing, as usual. Okay. So thank you, everyone. Uh, it's getting late. Uh, for all the Muslim brothers and sisters, thank you for staying back. And uh, have a good uh, breakfast, yeah? And, uh, and thank you, everyone else, for joining the session today. Thank you, Dato. Uh, he has stayed the full session. Uh, and also, Dr. Hari and the rest of my colleagues have also stayed back uh, for the uh, show today. Thank you. And we will have one more session coming up. Uh, as I said, and as also what Dash said, we've got this running uh, 12 times and we've got the CEO series uh, six times, yeah, from now until October. So take care, drive safe, stay safe, yeah. Thank you.